I'd like to talk about a few details of the book, uh, but before I do, I wanted to make a... Um, I guess you'd call it a spoiler warning. Uh, I want to let everyone listening know that uh, I was going to talk about some of the, the events at the end of Hunters, and this interview is going to be placed at the end of the recording, so the assumption is everyone will already know about these things, but just in case someone listening uh, doesn't already know what happens at the end of the book, I want to give you the opportunity to hit pause now. Run away. Exactly. Um, the last few chapters of the book, when the identities of the old man and woman are revealed... I know that fans of your most recent Dune, the prequel trilogy, uh, beginning with the Butlerian Jihad, they're finally going to get to see two of their absolute favorite characters return, uh, which is cause for great rejoicing. Uh, Omnius and Erasmus really serve as the bridge between the two eras, you know, the Butlerian Jihad and the current timeline. Um, I was wondering if you could tell us how that came about. Uh, at what point did you realize that these two couples, these these Essentially, four characters were indeed two characters, that they, that they were the same. Well, this is where <clears throat> Omnius and Erasmus are actually characters that Kevin and I created, um, and they were not based on any, any notes that we found of, of Frank Herbert's at all. But we combined those two characters that we created, that we, and, and these are concepts. Um, it was a story concept that we threaded in, knowing we were heading for Hunters of Dune and Sandworms. We combined what we added, um, our, our own concept, to Frank Herbert's overview, and Frank Herbert's overview then is where we immerse these these two characters. Well, and Frank Herbert's the outline and the the roadmap or the the clues that he gave us told us basically the the origin of the old man and the old woman and, and where that it did tie all the way back to the Butlerian Jihad and that it it did connect this whole vast story arc and, and epic history that he had come up with, mm. uh, which is kind of one of the reasons why we had to do the Butler and Jihad books before we could go all the way to Hunters and Sandworms, because we needed to lay this whole foundation. Now, that's one of the differences between our writing style and Frank Herbert's writing style, is he often left a lot of things unsaid. He put them kind of in the background, sure. or between the lines, and uh, in fact, in, in Heretics of Dune, the, the planet Earth, I mean the planet Arrakis, is uh, is charred and, and basically destroyed. All the life on it is supposedly killed. And he does that in between chapters. He doesn't show it. Uh, and Brian and I, our writing style is kind of a more, uh, we want to show you things and, and do it on stage instead of off stage. And so, whereas Frank Herbert, if he had been around to write Dune 7, which Frankly, Brian and I would rather he had stayed around to write it so that we could read it like new fans mm -hmm. instead of writing it. But um, he would have left a lot of the details in the background and, and up to his readers to put together. And we kind of like to show everything instead. And that's why we wanted to build this whole history always knowing where it was going because we kind of joked at our book signings and our talks that once we found the outline that... We knew what the secret was, but we weren't going to tell anybody else for, for a couple Well, of years. And, and it's kind of interesting because the, the fans are actually part of the creative process in a sense. They've inspired us. I remember Kevin and I were giving a talk, I think it was in Santa Cruz, California, and um, I, I, said to, I, I turned and said to Kevin in front of the audience, wouldn't it be great to start Hundreds of Dune with a scene of the destruction of Arrakis? Um, which would be a backstory, you know, from from the end of Frank Herbert's book, and so then Kevin started riffing off of that, and and we we started brainstorming right there in in front of the crowd, and it was it was fun. And we came up with the first sentence, which we actually used the, uh, yeah. the day he died. The planet Arrakis also died, or, or something. yeah, Kevin Kevin came up with that line, and uh, and we used it. Yeah, oh, that's fabulous. Because mm -hmm. as, as a reader, when I read Heretics of Dune, I thought. How could you destroy the planet Arrakis and not show it? So <laughs> right. now we got to show it. Oh, that's terrific. Uh, was there an intention, do you think, uh, on your father's part, Brian, to perhaps inject uh, a bit of himself and your mother into the characters of the old man and the old woman? I mean, I, 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 I realize they were bad guys, of course. I, I mean, no disrespect intended. But, uh, mm. but, but when I read Chapter House 20 years ago, and especially when uh, when I read Hunters, I was reminded that your parents were a team. Um, mm -hmm. They were a partnership, and they'd, and they'd fashioned this universe together. And and on the page, you have an elderly couple, and they're 
they seemingly they're seemingly omnipotent at times they're watching over this universe from from a remote vantage point and i i couldn't help thinking of your parents doing the same thing watching events in the dune universe unfold well i'll just add one more element to that they they both love to work in the garden um, of course. So, and, and I guess you could say that their stories were were, were the, the the plants and flowers that they were nurturing. But um, I, I think that my, my dad, when he created characters, he always took elements of, of various people and put them into it. But um, that that could have been part of it. But I, I would say that would be a subconscious element to it. But uh, that's an interesting observation. I, I like that. Why don't we take that away? From, take that. Kevin, and we'll, we'll get credit for it now. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's a good one, Scott. I hadn't noticed that myself. I kind of had a chill when Scott just mentioned it. I thought, oh, that's so obvious. How come I didn't see that before? Well, a- again, I kept I kept reminding myself, well, these I know these are bad guys, but I, I, I couldn't help it. As I was imagining them, I, I saw their, their image in my mind. Mm-hmm. So... Well, bad guys is a relative term. You know? Exactly. They're, they're, they have got the best motivations to themselves. Mm-hmm. Well, and as you said earlier about the... Uh, the two of the most uh, anticipated characters or beloved characters or something, I went, Omnius and Erasmus, they're horrible people. Horrible <laughs> <laughs> isn't even the right word. But they're the lovable rogues, especially Erasmus, obviously. I, yeah. I think he's probably the best character that we've created in all of these books. We just, we and, and, you know, Erasmus, you know, uh, Erasmus <clears throat> is, is, is a concept of Kevin's. And then he had me, um, and then I said, well, why don't we add like a Joseph Mengele uh, aspect to his character. That's the Nazi doctor of death. And then and Kevin said to me, well, that sounds really sick, Brian. Maybe you'd better write the, the first draft on that one. But, but he was definitely a, a composite uh, between Kevin and me. Well, we kind of fight over who got to write those chapters. I think we split them half and half just because they're so much fun. Mm-hmm. I remember years ago being in a, a science fiction literature class, as a matter of fact, uh, back at UCLA, and the professor said that the definition of a great character is when the readers wonder what happens to him or her after the last page is turned. Mm-hmm. You know, they wonder what is you know what is Erasmus doing now, and uh, he definitely fits that criteria. I think all of the fans have been curious what's what's been going on since the end of uh, the Battle of Corin. The, the irascible Erasmus. <laughs> there's a um, there's a long proud tradition in the Dune novels, and um, I'm speaking of the the tradition of cloning great characters. Uh, Duncan Idaho, especially, he's permeated this entire series since the first Gola hate was was uh, uh, brought out of the incubation tanks. Um, Wondering how that happened originally. I, I'm not clear about how how he wound up becoming part of the series again. Was it a case of Duncan being one of Frank's favorite characters and he wanted him back, or did the fans just get really vocal? And well, have you seen the movie Misery or the read Stephen King's book? Sure. Um, the, the the fan doesn't want the character to be killed off. Right. And basically, the same thing happened to Dad, except that he wasn't taken prisoner. Um, he got a Go deluge ahead. of fan letters saying, "How could you kill Duncan Idaho off? He's the, you know we like him even better than Paul Atreides or as much." And, and so Dad figured out a way to bring him back. And I guess he went to the old concept of a of a golem and changed it into a gola, and then added the cloning element, except it was dead cells instead of live cells. And voila, we have Duncan Idaho again. Well, and then we have other characters too, mm-hmm. which exactly. Which, I mean, a lot of the characters just are, are brought back again and again, and that poses a completely different challenge for for us as writers because if you can always bring a character back, then what's the real peril you can you can put the character into? Because anytime somebody gets killed, then the reader will just shrug and say they'll bring them back if they want to. Mm-hmm. So it, the challenge is to make make the situations they're in seem emotionally engaging enough so that the reader cares what happens. Well, absolutely. I mean, uh, I can't remember how many times, you know, the God Emperor squished Duncan Idaho. Um, well, we, we also had that challenge on a, on, a, on, a, on a big scale of story arcs when we wrote our prequels because everybody knows generally where the prequels are going to end and how do we get there in an in inter- interesting way. Sure. Mm-hmm. Yet, you know, these the Gola characters still seem, every every incarnation still seems unique, and there's still obviously room for growth. They still have their own arc. Um, well, they have some unpredictable elements to them with that Frank Herbert 
put in there, and that's that's always good. Thank you both very much for the time. Thank you for okay. uh, being so generous and for uh, joining us here today. Okay, Scott. Thank you. Thank you, Scott. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Scott. Okay.